It's wonderful to be here. I'm so enjoying it, and it always feels so welcoming and wonderful. So last night, we talked about the power of belief and how belief actually creates changes in the informational molecules of the body that can help to heal us or, on the other hand, can stress us out. Tonight, we're going a little bit further into health and wellness by looking at the mind, particularly looking at, let's see if we can get these slides up, the neuroscience of the ecstatic spectrum. How does that sound? That's exciting. So a little background. Um, Back in the mid-1950s, 1960s, um, when I was still in college, I became aware of Dr. Herbert Benson's work at Harvard Medical School. And what fascinated me about it is that he was doing the very first experiments on biofeedback. And now, you know, this is not surprising. Back then, some, how many years ago? That was a long time ago, 1965. It was very exciting that you could become conscious of your unconscious processes and then actually modulate your physiology. And Benson was a cardiologist, and he became first interested in how, if you became aware of physical sensations of blood pressure, you could lower it, lower your blood pressure. And then by the time I decided to study with him and be a graduate student under him at Harvard Medical School, the Maharishi had come upon the scene, Maharishi Mahesh Yogi. And all of a sudden, meditation had hit the college campuses. People were meditating. And my early history, I'd had a number of mystical experiences, but I still didn't have any control of my mind. Today in the workshop, we were talking about the fact that that stress and trauma are inherited across the generations, that little tags get bound to your DNA, which can cause gene activation or gene silencing. And so literally what's gone on with your ancestors is going on with you. And so even though I was studying biofeedback, I hadn't started to meditate yet, and I didn't really have very much control of my own mind. Therefore, at 21, um, I had multiple health problems. I had high blood pressure already. I had chronic back pain. I had migraine headaches. And I had irritable bowel syndrome. And I actually, my nickname in graduate school was Psychosomatic Sally, because whatever like illness was caused by the mind, I had it, and it was my lab partner in physiology um, in the first year of medical school (laughs) who turned to me one day and he said, you know, Joan, you have an incredibly powerful mind. And I said, what on earth do you mean by that? Like, my mind drives me crazy. And he said, well, your body cannot tell the difference between what you're imagining and what's actually happening. And so it responds to that. And your mind is so powerful at conjuring up fear and worry that your body takes the shape of that. And today we were talking a little bit in the workshop about the work of Dr. Candace Pert, the late Dr. Candace Pert, who was really the mother of mind-body medicine. And Candace always said, your body is actually your subconscious mind. Everything that's going on in there shows up in your body. So my lab partner in physiology was telling me that in his own terms. This was now 1967. And so he said to me, you need to learn to control your mind. You need to learn to meditate. And you need to learn to do yoga. 
This was big news in 1967. Um, people weren't doing yoga uh, to speak of. It was really hard to find a yoga teacher. You couldn't go to your local mall. And it was the same with meditation. But little by little, especially working with Herb Benson, I discovered uh, some meditation teachers, started to practice yoga, and within six months, my physical problems had more or less vanished. So by um, later on, having worked with Benson for a number of years, and then gone off to be a cancer cell biologist, and then coming back to his laboratory and when did I leave? 1978. This is when meditation research really started to pick up because there was new technology, a lot of neuroscience. There was all kinds of brain scanning techniques. And in 1979, His Holiness the Dalai Lama came to Harvard. I have to tell you a very brief story about that. Um, I had been at a garage sale one weekend and picked up a little book with a cover that was ripped off called Magic and Mystery in Tibet by Alexandra David Neal. And she was a French opera singer, and she died at the age of 100 in the 1960s. And somehow or other, she had an intrinsic sense that she needed to go to Tibet. And this was before people weren't traveling out of Tibet. It was a a pretty closed country there in the land of the snows. Nobody knew much about it. But there was a Tibetan man who had left Tibet and lived in, uh, in Paris. And she met him and learned to speak Tibetan. Uh, and she was the original Yentl. She posed as a male monk, shaved her head, and sneaked into a monastery in Tibet posing as a male. Is that cool? I mean, think about this in her time. And she had a lot of really interesting experiences and wrote a book called Magic and Mystery in Tibet and other books later about Tibetan Buddhism. But it was her book, Magic and Mystery in Tibet, that I found without a cover. And I read it with great interest all weekend. And there were two types of meditation practice that were described in there um, that particularly piqued my interest because Benson was known for studying the calming effects of meditation, that it calmed down the sympathetic nervous system, which is why it lowers high blood pressure, it can even out heart rate. It has, now we know it does so many things for the body, Um, really helps the immune system, calms down inflammation, um, and changes the brain, which we will get to. But the, what fascinated me was that she was talking about physiological effects in magic and mystery in Tibet that were not so much about calming. So one of the things she described was a process called Tumo Yoga, G-T-U-M-O, And Tumo in Tibetan means fierce woman. It's like the kundalini energy, the shakti energy. And she described a process of how the monks on a full moon in Tibet, on the Tibetan New Year, would raise up the kundalini energy. And it would cause them to emanate a tremendous amount of heat. So they'd sit in the cold caves with wet sheets around them. In the course of the night, they would dry piles of sheets from their body heat. And I thought, that's a really interesting physiological effect that's very different than the relaxation response. So I read on, and then I came to a practice that's called Longompa. And what it is, is a way to train long-distance runners, because there were no cell phones, there were no telegraphs, 
the monasteries were far separated, high in the mountains. How were they going to get news from place to place? They sent runners. And how, how do you manage in a terrain like that to run, to withstand the elements, to get where you're going? And the training for this was a hole was dug 10 feet deep. And the person being trained in Longompa sat in the bottom of the hole until they learned to levitate. And that helped them run with like great speedy speed. So I got all excited. I couldn't wait to get to work Monday morning and tell Herb, hey, there's effects, physiological effects of meditation that are way different from the relaxation response. So I get in there and I'm clutching my little book without the cover. And I sit down to tell Herb the good news. And he said, but wait, I have good news for you. His Holiness the Dalai Lama is coming to Harvard for the first time in a couple of months. And he's interested in doing meditation research. So we have an audience with him. So I was so excited. I couldn't believe it. We get to meet with His Holiness. So this is October 1979. And I thought about it and thought about it. And, you know, we had to learn all the protocols so that we could greet him properly and all of that. And as soon as we met him, I blurted out, Your Holiness, is there anybody left who does Longon Pa? Because it would be great to study them. And he just burst out in gales of laughter. I mean, gales of laughter. He's, he's very funny, very light-spirited. And he said, oh, we have no need. Now we just take airplanes. <laughs> so then I asked him about the Tumo Yoga, and he said, yes. That's a completion process that every monk must learn. And so Benson went with a whole team of physiologists from Harvard to Dharamsala, where the Tibetans live in exile, and studied the monks. And indeed, they can increase their external body temperature by about 10 degrees Fahrenheit without increasing their core temperature. So that was really the beginning of the study of people who had intensive practice in meditation, more than 10,000 hours of practice. And there's now been, since that time, so many advances in you know, SPECT scanning, functional magnetic resonance imagery, um, all kinds of physiological measures of these little little informational molecules that the body puts out that change the DNA, that now we really have begun to understand a little bit more about how processes of managing the mind affect the body. And that's what I want to talk to you about tonight. And many of these um, practices are volitional. We learn how to meditate. Uh, we learn how to focus concentration. We learn to be mindful. We learn perhaps to do loving kindness meditation or other types of meditation. And they all have different effects on physical health and mental health. So that now some of these things have become personalized. Someone comes to me, for example, for a physical or a mental health um, concern, and depending on who they are and what their belief system is and what's needed, we'll give them something else. But then the kind of spectrum, the word spectrum of ecstatic experience was coined by a man called Stephen Kotler. And he's an extreme athlete who's interested in flow states and peak performance states. And so now all of that has come together with the health literature and has come together with all of these new techniques of looking at not only volitional states that we create, but mystical experiences that happen to us 
um, without necessarily our volition, and also psychedelic research, which after a long period of laying dormant um, has now been fast-tracked by the FDA, particularly there are a number of studies using psilocybin with people who have terminal illness. And in about 80% of those people, anxiety and depression is so far reduced that in many, many people, the fear of death is taken away. So it's a very interesting time in the exploration of the, quote, ecstatic spectrum. So let's get into this. Uh, and we'll look at some of the neuroscience of it. By the way, I, f I forgot my last slide last night. And I know that some of you are um, interested in the subject matter for yourself, and others of you teach, uh, help other people. And if you want the slides, what I'm going to do is make a PDF of both satsang talks and both workshops. Be ready in about a week. And if you text the word synapse to 33777, it's wrong on the little phone there, um, I will send you all of the slides so you don't have to like take furious notes if you're interested in any of this. Okay, so the word ecstatic itself is very interesting. The word ecstatic actually means self-transcendence. And really, it's all about the transcendence of the ego and the reality that we create with the conditioning that we have and the things that we tell ourselves. So. In my own mind, the ecstatic spectrum is all about ex escaping our conditioned mind, our pre-patterned, pre-installed beliefs that are there from the time that we're children, because those beliefs are installed in the time before we're seven years old, when we start to have truly conscious thought. Um, kids are in a theta state, a state of hypnosis, and observe what's going on all around them. And simply like a computer are being programmed with it. So we don't see reality. That's what we looked at last night. We see through the filter of what's been installed in us. And to escape that conditioned mind, that's what it takes to drop into that core self, that divine self that's obviously much more expansive and touch a deeper level of reality. So my husband, whose name is Gordon DeVaron, um, Gordon and I love, of course, to explore these things together and to talk about these things. And he coined a phrase, spiritual synapses, for those things that connect us to an expanded way of knowing. And these things that connect us to an expanded way of knowing have the capacity to transform our perception of reality, our perception of our own past. Uh, they have the capacity to allow us to actually be in the present moment and to uh, project different wishes and desires into our future. And they affect, obviously, our mood, our behavior, our health, and our values. In short, uh, what Gordy calls spiritual synapses are connectors to wisdom, compassion, and various kinds of pro-social behaviors. Um, they're connectors to the various virtues that different religious traditions tell us about. And by the way, Tomorrow's workshop is all about how we develop the virtues, the different character strengths. Uh, and it's, it's really a, a fun process to study these. I like to call the character strengths the graces. And there are things like courage and compassion and wisdom. In any case, 
Here are a few of the kinds of spiritual synapses, connectors to wisdom that are being studied right now. Of course, meditation, mindfulness, yoga. And there are a number of studies now looking at nature, the effect of nature. We are nature, we're part of nature. And we, we need to be in nature in order to be healthy. Uh, there are studies about silence, about presence, about awe. One of the most amazing states is awe. And one of the character strengths or graces that one can develop is a deep appreciation of beauty and excellence. And that helps us to cultivate the ability to be present and experience awe. Uh, if you just Google awe, you'll come up with a couple of great TED Talks by Dasher Keltner, who's at the, um, the, the center at Berkeley that really studies positive psychology, health, and uh, the science of the greater good. Compassion. Uh, the last couple of years that I was here, I was giving talks on some of the research on compassion. Love, gratitude. You know, gratitude is a character strength that we can easily develop. And of all of the character strengths, again, what I like to call the graces, the one that is most related to physical, mental, uh, physical and mental well-being is gratitude. There are lots of studies on forgiveness, generosity, surrender, creativity, curiosity, flow, music, and what happens during eureka moments, aha moments. And so I want to go through just a little, about, little of this with you. So an example of a eureka moment that I can only give you a tiny sketch of, and if you've heard me speak before, I've had a lot of eureka moments, and I love to share them, but my mom uh, died back in 1988, and my son and I were at her deathbed, and it was, it was a remarkable experience anyhow. Uh, my mother and I did not get along well. We were like oil and water, more or less. There was not a lot of mutual appreciation. But without going into it, I wish I could tell the story, but it can only give you a tiny taste or it'll take too much time. But she'd been taken away on the day that she died to have some tests and she didn't come upstairs to her room. The family was waiting for her. So I happened to work in the hospital in which she was dying. And so I had my white coat, and I knew where she'd been taken. And the family said, don't wait, go find her. You know, maybe she died already, and nobody has told us. So I went down to the basement of the hospital where she was on a gurney, waiting for a scan because she had an internal bleed. And it, it was actually a little bit of a funny story because um, the physician in charge, I went to get him, and he came over. I said, what's with this? She's been here for like six hours, lying by herself on a gurney, and she's dying. And there were apologies and all of that, and finally, my mother, who was very funny anyhow, looked at the doctor. She said, well, I want to go to my room. And he said, you can't. We need a diagnosis. And she looked at him with, like, all of the, her remaining blood came into her face. And she looked at him, and she said, I'm dying, you idiot. How's that for a diagnosis? <laughs> and honest to God, well, it was time to close the unit anyhow. It was just about 5 o'clock. So he said, OK, you can go to your room. And my mother said to me, oh, great, take me to my room. And the doctor said, no, 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 hospital policy. Only an orderly can take her to the room. And my mother looked at me. She said, ignore him. Just steal the body. So it was like <laughs> the scene from a Woody Allen film. I'm kind of running with my white coat flapping, 
wheeling her to the elevator and hoping that I'm not going to get fired for violating hospital rules. We get into the elevator. We're in the basement. We're going to the seventh floor where her room is. And she knows that she's going. And she wasted no time. She said, Joni, I want to know before I die if you could forgive me because I've been so critical of you. And I was just hoping if I criticized you first, then other people wouldn't and you'd get more love. And, you know, I realized, oh my God, she's loved me all along. That's all we want to know. And so I told her, I forgive you. And then I said to her, I've been mad at you and judged you most of your life. I've been dutiful, but never loving. Could you forgive me? And we forgave each other, just <laughs> in the distance of seven floors. Whenever I tell this story, I think of a line from The Course in Miracles, which is, the holiest place on earth is where an ancient hatred becomes a present love. And the love was so thick, the vibration was so strong. I said something, I mean, my mother was not a spiritual person, and she was the kind of person that laughed at spirituality. But I said to her, I would like to exchange a soul quality with you. And what we're doing tomorrow, that what I call the graces, character strengths, or soul qualities. And so I said to her, um, she said, oh, that's wonderful. She said, what I would like from you is the gift of compassion. That really got me because I never knew that she saw that in me particularly as I hadn't shown it to her. And from her, I said, you have courage. I tend to be easily frightened and stressed. You can endure anything. I would like courage. And what you see in this picture is a couple of weeks after she died, that says courage. It looks like Coca-Cola, doesn't it? That swirly white thing? I thought it was. It was sitting by the coffee maker, and I hadn't told anybody in my house about this. And so I find it next to the coffee maker, and I asked my husband and my two sons, where did that come from? And they all said, we've never seen it before. And I think it was a direct manifestation from the spirit world. And I put it in a frame, and I always have it on my altar. But also during that time, now I can't, the, the most important part of the story was that I was sitting with my son, um, who was 20 at that time, my oldest son, Justin, and we were keeping the deathbed vigil. And both of us went into the light with my mother when she died. Um, I had a complete life review, not of my life per se, but of scenes from the life that we had together. And there was so much love there, and so much insight, and so much understanding. And when it was over, um, I knew that she had died. Um, I'm going through this so quickly, but let me tell you, in an experience like that, when you go into the divine light, it is so loving. There's nothing there but loving kindness. There's not a drop of judgment. It is just, it's, there are no words um, for an experience like this. Completely life-changing. When I came out of that experience, I knew she'd given birth to me into this realm. And I had just participated in birthing her soul back into another realm. It was an amazing experience. And she was at this point, had passed, left her body. And I looked over her dead body, and there's my son, Justin. And literally, the room was filled with light. 
um, how to explain it. You could see that everything was made of light, but the light was had densities in it that was form. So you saw the light and form at once. And I saw that my son had a halo. I thought of the Renaissance painters because when you're in that particular state of consciousness where you see light and form, you see halos around people. And he was weeping and there were tiny little rainbows coming from his tears. And he looked at me and he said, Mom, the room is filled with light. Can you see it? And I said, I see it. I see it. And he's weeping. And he says to me, this is Grandma's last gift. She's holding open the door to eternity so that we can have a glimpse. And... Um, one of my friends, Raymond Moody, who wrote really the first book on um, near-death experiences, wrote, wrote a book about what he calls empathic death experiences, when a loved one's dying and you go into the light with them. And he called it um, glimpses of eternity after what Justin um, had said in this experience. Uh, I guess I have to say a few more words. I want to make sure I get to the science here. Um, what Justin said was he looked at me and he said, you must be so grateful to Grandma. And I said, for the first time in my life, I am really grateful. And he said to me, we both had visions that were very different. Um, and he said that in his vision, what he saw is that she was a very great being who took on a role in this life that was much smaller than who she really was as a gift to me because I had to feel unloved in order to become a teacher of love. And that one experience completely changed my life. It was one of these eureka moments. So... William James, uh, who wrote a book called The Variety of Religious Experience back in 1902, was the first one to really write carefully in the Western world about what the characteristics of such a mystical experience are. And he said, these are brief interludes beyond space and time that feel realer than real. And that's what I felt. I felt like in the vision I had touched true reality, that this reality is, you know, li like literally seeing through a glass darkly. He said these experiences are ineffable. They're completely beyond verbal description. They are noetic. The individual feels that they've received precious wisdom beyond ordinary worldly knowledge and that they're passive, that the experience comes upon the person as a kind of passing grace. In other words, its occurrence is beyond conscious volition or control. Um, now we study things like this. There's actually, uh, <laughs> years after William James, a century later, a whole field called neurotheology. And... Mm -hmm. I want to say that my favorite writer when I was a teenager was Aldous Huxley. I reread The Doors of Perception probably 10 times in high school. Uh, I was fascinated by it. He was describing a uh, reality from a mescaline experience that he had. And it was so like mystical experiences. I've had so many of them starting in, in childhood. And I loved his book, the utopian novel Island, which came out in 1962. He was way ahead of the curve. He actually coined the term neurotheology, which we now understand as the cognitive neuroscience of religious experience and spirituality. And in, in the island, if you haven't read the book, 
there are these like minor birds up in the trees and they're always saying, attention, attention, here and now, here and now, bringing you back to the reality of the present moment. So let's fast forward 30 years. In the 1990s, uh, a young physician, Andrew Newberg, began studying the experience of oneness because he had had a personal transformative experience of, you know, quite different, obviously, than the one I just described to you with my mom. But something that was equally transformative for him and that experience of oneness um, was such a big part of it. Since that time, which was for him between college and medical school, he's written eight books, and he's really brought science to Huxley's neurotheology. So here are two of his titles, Principles of Neurotheology. In his most recent book, How Enlightenment Changes the Brain, The New Science of Transformation. So Andrew Newberg goes through five characteristics of enlightenment. Um, one of them is the sense of oneness. When you recognize <laughs> you're not some isolated being, that's an optical delusion of consciousness, as Einstein would have described it. You're part of something um, much, much larger. These experiences, according to Newberg, are associated with a newfound sense of clarity. They have to them an emotional and sensual intensity. Um, when I think back on experiences like this and describe them, they are so real that I still feel transfigured by them. They're intense. They're accompanied by a sense of surrender and they result in a permanent change in some core aspect of a person's life. These changes, um, I love this scientific part, they can all be related to specific brain areas and functions, yet they represent input from the entire brain. So spirituality, according to Dr. Newberg, is a whole brain experience. This is a quote from uh, one of his books. The experiences are so multidimensional. There are emotions, feelings of surrender, feelings of oneness all happening at the same time. So we thought there'd be a variety of complex changes going on, he means in the brain. We've argued for this similarly with spirituality, religiousness in general. Spirituality can be expressed through emotions, creativity, cognitive processes, or experiences. Given the richness and diversity of these experiences, it seems much more likely that the whole brain is involved. And so all of the research on this kind of stuff that's been going on since 1979 or so, um, is very rich. There's all kinds of scanning uh, data available, and we'll just looking, look at a bit of it. But the most basic thing, you know, when we meditated together tonight, is managing your attention. Where is your attention going? Uh, is your mind wandering, or are you able at least at times to keep it to a single point. This is very basic because a wandering mind is an unhappy mind. Um, this is a very interesting experiment that was done about a decade ago. A couple of researchers, Matt Killingsworth and Dan Gilbert, prompted 2,200 people on their iPhones to answer the following questions. What are you doing right now? Are you thinking about something other than what you're currently doing? How are you feeling right now? People reported being off task almost 50% of the time. And 
they also reported being less happy when their minds were wandering. And it turns out what they said is a wandering mind is an unhappy mind. And we're going to look at what happens shortly as the mind wanders and how meditation helps us not to have a wandering mind. And that really reduces the stress and gives us better health. Okay, so this is a quote from Michael Pollan. We quoted him last night. And it's from his most recent book called How to Change Your Mind. So Michael Pollan says this, For me, spiritual is a good name for some of the powerful mental phenomena that arise when the voice of the ego is muted or silenced. There is much more to consciousness than the ego, as we would see if we just shut up. But the ego, that inner neurotic who insists on running the mental show, is wily and doesn't relinquish its power without a struggle. So true. Because the ego is comprised of all of those beliefs that got installed before we became conscious at the age of about seven. And that stuff runs in the background all the time. So how do we get it to be quiet? So instead of seeing through our preconceptions, we can see a little bit more clearly what is. So get an ego to just shut up. Well, of course, meditation and mindfulness training. Karma yoga, what so many of you are doing here, reversing the flow of your attention away from your separate self toward the service of others. Various psychedelic experiences. We're that way when we're in the state of flow. Whoops. And mystical experiences. Um, Andrew Weil is very fond of psychoeducation. And I'll talk about that in a moment. Just checking the time here. Okay. Whoops. Come on there. Next slide. Okay. All right, I'm going to give you a little bit of an overview now of the neuroscience of spirituality. And then you'll see how we get that wandering mind to be quiet so that the core self can show up. So, number one, when we contemplate personal spiritual experience. That's what I was just doing with you. I was contemplating a personal spiritual experience. I was reliving it through sharing it. It's very rewarding. It increases activity in a part of the brain called the nucleus accumbens, as well as the frontal attention and ventromedial, that means the bottom and the middle, like where the third eye is, the ventromedial prefrontal cortical loci, science speak. But the bottom line is it activates pleasure and reward circuitry. Concentration meditation, um, that's what we were, were doing earlier. We were concentrating on breath, on location, whether it was in the third eye or the heart, and mantra. That kind of meditation and verbal prayer both increase activity in the frontal lobes of the brain and the most evolutionary recent part of the brain, the prefrontal cortex. This is where we think and plan and set goals because both of these types of activity require focused attention. Mindfulness meditation, on the other hand, decreases activity in a part of the brain that well, we may or may not have time to look at further, called the default mode network. I mentioned it last night. And what happens, it's called the default mode network because it's what the brain defaults to when we're told just don't do anything. Um, a, the original neuroscientist who found this had people in a functional magnetic resonance imagery scanner 
and he wanted a baseline. So he said, don't, you know, just, just be there. Don't think of anything. And their minds started to wander. And this particular circuit kicked in. So it's the default place where we go. And it's where we ruminate and why we get unhappy. So the default mode network, or DFM, and that's why mindfulness meditation is particularly helpful for anxiety, for changing your story, for overcoming depression, and to help stop ruminate, thus getting you into a flow state. Meditations that cultivate surrender, on the other hand, reduce activity in the frontal lobes of the brain and the prefrontal cortex because they were a renunciation of our own will and planning. Meditation, this is all, isn't it cool how they, they've now separated out all these things and looked at the different brain activities. Meditations where a sense of self is abdicated, like people who are being a medium or speaking in tongues, decreases activity in the frontal lobes and increases activity in a networking hub in the brain called the thalamus, which shunts information to other brain areas. And this is just all cool to me. If beings appear during a mystical experience, activity in the right and left temporal lobe network change. And this, this is part of um, an experiment that was done at Columbia University about a year ago. When we relive personally meaningful spiritual experiences in a guided imagery task, this leads to reduced activity in what's called the left inferior parietal lobe, which may affect perceptual processing of sense of self and others, leading to that sense of oneness. In flow states, there's a different physiology. Um, the timekeeping area of the brain, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, goes quiet. And that's the area concerned with impulse control and monitor monitoring, like the inner critic. So let's say you're an expert snowboarder and you're in the zone. You have complete confidence in the turn you're making in the air and how you're going to land, if you started to worry, are my feet in the right position, you'd be toast in no time flat. So all of that turns off, and the moment seems absolutely timeless. There's plenty of time to make the turn. And I find it really fascinating. Of course, we live in physical bodies, all these spiritual and mystical states have got um, a place. There are neural networks of ego and present moment. And I'm going to kind of zip through that and just say that the part of the brain that puts us in the present moment cannot operate at the same time the default mode network operates. The default mode network tends to graft our present experience onto old traumatic stories. And anything that brings you into the present moment, like mindfulness, turns off the DMN and puts you into the present moment. It's, this is called being anti-correlated. When one network is active, the other one is quiet. So there's a very cool researcher by the name of another physician, psychiatrist, Judson Brewer. He's one of the great meditation researchers. And he uses this wonderful analogy of our state of being. Um, he says, generally speaking, for most of us, you've got these two networks going. And the simplest metaphor, this is now a direct quote from him, is that it's like driving a car with one foot on the brake and one foot in the gas. In the analogy, the gas is our brain's natural function, being in the present moment. And the brake is self-referential processing. All the thoughts that separate us about I, me, and mine, that's what the default mode network does. So if you take your foot off the brain, Judd says, 
the brain functions more effortlessly. If you take your foot off the brake, our brain is like, thank God you got out of the way. So our natural state of being, our core self, being in the present moment, um, as soon as you get that ego state of self-referential processing out of the way, your natural state takes over. We're almost at the end. If I can get the slide to advance, I don't know why it won't, but we'll fix that, maybe, and maybe not. Maybe this is the computer's way of saying, it's time to wrap up. So I think I'm going to end on this slide. And the question is, can we change our brain volitionally? And the answer is yes. We can grow the inner strengths of being able to be in the moment, of being courageous, of being compassionate. All of these states can actually be installed in our brain circuitry by becoming aware of them. I mentioned last week one of my very favorite um, people on earth, and that's Rick Hansen. I always think of him as Mr. Rogers. When you enter his neighborhood, it's always safe. It's always joyful. He always has something great to say. And he's got a new book coming out in a couple of months called Neurodharma, where he does something um, amazing. He takes the real Buddhist teachings and goes into depth with them, shows you what's going on in the brain, and provides really simple exercise sizes that you can do. For example, when your default mode network is busy ruminating and you catch yourself, if you just lift your eyes and you look at the sky, you look at a greater perspective, that activates that network of being present and cuts off the default mode network. And there are so many little ways of doing that. So tomorrow in the workshop, um, we'll look at some of those ways of learning to become more present. And we'll look at positive psychology, how we can cultivate and install these virtues and graces and learn to change our brain. But right now, um, what we know is that inner strengths are grown from experiences of those strengths, activated states. So if you have a moment where you're feeling compassionate, if you just savor that moment, stay with it, feel the feelings, let it be embodied, your brain starts to make greater compassion circuits. And an activative state can then be installed as traits. Much of the research on the ecstatic spectrum depends on subjects re-experiencing altered states. So this is the last word, because I know we're, we're at time now. But um, Dr. Newberg underlines the importance of psychoeducation and practice, like any skill, from playing the piano to playing tennis. Repetition strengthens neural circuits. So if you write about your spiritual experiences, if you talk about them, if you reimagine them, uh, you will be installing them. If you begin to notice, like, oh, my default mode network is active now, I'm worrying, and simply label it worrying, lift your gaze, um, change the focus from what's going on in your head to the beauty of nature, something like that, you will become more present and mindful. If you meditate just a tiny bit during the day, look up from the computer, do a minute of meditation. You know, whether it's a body scan, whether it's your mantra, whether it's a moment of mindfulness, whatever it is, if you repeat that during the day, 
little by little, you're creating these various neural circuits that we're talking about. Scan your body, stretch when it's needed, and little by little, you really embody what we chanted, which is bliss, I am bliss, <laughs> bliss absolute. And in the middle of a human experience, with its 10,000 sorrows, you'll find there are also what the Buddha talked about, the 10,000 joys. And becoming spacious enough to contain the joys and the sorrows is what we do as human beings. So I hope some of you will join me tomorrow as we look at how we install the graces and the virtues and switch our attention from that default mode back to our hearts and our true natures. So thank you very much. Thank you.